suppose it's all true, mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God, what will Stephen Fry say to him? I will basically, what's known as the Odyssey, I think, I, I'll say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's a, uh, a very emotionally charged and rhetorically powerful articulation of the problem of suffering. To be honest, I find that, I think from an Islamic perspective, the answer is, is easy, it's not difficult. And I think even historically, it's been a much larger debate in the European tradition, the Christian European tradition, than it has been. In, in Islam. The reason there's suffering in the world, and I'll get to a specific example as well, but the reason there's suffering in the world is a function number one of free will, number two of the fact that life is a test, and number three of the fact that life is a is a pathway to an afterlife, which is which not only to assert a certain trajectory, but also to say that this life is relatively less important than the afterlife. So let me unpack that a little bit. You can't have free will without the possibility of suffering. Like people people have to be able to do the wrong thing. And a lot of the suffering in the world is caused by human actions. In fact, I would argue from an Islamic perspective that uh, evil in the world is by and large a function of human actions, not acts of God, what we call acts of God. But, but that, no, I should recognise here that that explanation explains what some people call moral evil, right? P actions done by humans, but not natural evil. There's another category uh, called natural evil, things that, are, that cause suffering and not, that have nothing to do with human beings or human actions, right? But those are also explained by the other, other two things that I mentioned. Number one, uh, life is a test. So you can't have a test without suffering. Again, people will tend to say, yeah, okay, that's true. Someone's individual child passes away. That's a test for them. But, you know, what about a tsunami comes and it kills 10,000 people? What's that, what type of test is that? That brings us to the third point as well. Uh, there's an afterlife. I think this point is probably the most important one. Because a lot of times when atheists bring up this problem of suffering, they're doing something which is logically fallacious. Why? Because for them, the problem of suffering is an argument to say that your view of God is incoherent. Your theology, your worldview is incoherent. Incoherence is a different type of argument than an argument that says you haven't got evidence for something. This is like, regardless of whether you have evidence or not, the idea is absurd. It doesn't make sense. It's incoherent. But when you're making an argument from coherence or against coherence, you need to consider the propositions within that worldview. I can't take a few aspects and then put them into my own notion of the world and then go, oh, that doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. like that. Now, wh what, where am I taking this? What atheists do is they take a few religious premises about the idea of God, put it within their naturalist worldview and then go, that doesn't make sense. Let's, let's demonstrate that with this example of, of uh, bone cancer in children. All right, let's say hypothetically, that, you know, five-year-old child, 10-year-old child, 15-year-old has bone cancer, struggles with it for two or three years, suffers a lot, the family suffers, passes away. At one level, that's a test for the family, for a lot of people. Right? And if he, if he died in a car accident, the result's the same. It's just that there's more suffering. But nevertheless, the point is, can we judge that to be evil? All right? Now, the bone cancer wasn't, wasn't caused by human beings. So is this in case of natural evil? Why is it evil? Well, the assumption seems to be person suffered, didn't get to live life, very young, struggled, died. End of it. It's not the end of it, right? If that was if that was it, I can I could probably say, yeah, that sounds a bit, that seems evil. But what if I said, hang on a minute, same same scenario, exactly the same thing, same factors. Child suffers with bone cancer, two, three years, struggles, passes away. As a child from Islamic tradition, they're gonna spend the eternity in, in paradise, right? Is that evil? Because this is this is where there's a lot of unknowns, right? Now I'm not suggesting we know the unknowns, but I'm saying all I need to show is that there's various unknowns. It's very arrogant of you to not consider them or to think you know them, right? And then say, well, why, why is this and how dare you and the rest of it? But getting back to my point, what I'm trying to say is, obviously Stephen Fry is not going to consider the afterlife. But when he's doing that, it's a logically fallacious way of making an argument about some other worldview being incoherent, right? He can't do that. And so from our perspective, it's very simple. There is suffering in the world. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. We understand at this broad level, as I said, free will, life's a test. And there's other details around, around them, and there's an afterlife where justice is served. But the specifics, only God knows. In any particular case, we don't know the unseen, we don't know the details of various things, God knows them. So, but there's no case there to be made that the, that the concept is fundamentally incoherent or absurd. And so really, as I said, Stephen Fry, he's being more rhetorical in the, in the manner of the new atheists than truly bringing new substance to this debate.